Well, welcome guys to week number five of our perspective study on faithful endurance. Um, go ahead and grab your Bibles and make sure you have them ready at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And go ahead and leave it off to the side. We're going to be coming back to it in just a minute. But we wanted to start, I wanted to start by first bringing our attention to our responsibility as men. Our responsibility of the four P's of manhood. Uh, number one, many of you guys have heard these before, but just as a refresher, maybe you haven't heard them. But number one of the first four P's is protector. 1 Timothy 6, 18 to 20 says, Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust. Men are called to be protectors. Secondly, men are called to be providers. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Thirdly, men are called to be pursuers. Pursuers. 1 Timothy 6.11-12 says, But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Men, you're called to be pursuers. And lastly, men are called to be pastors. They're called to be pastors within the community, called to be pastors within their home. Ephesians 5, 22 to 23 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her within the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. Men were called to proclaim the Lord and be the spiritual leaders to those God has entrusted to us. We are to live lives separated from the lusts of the flesh and committed to the things of the Lord. So our lives are a worthy example, not just to our families, but to all. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 says, but you are chosen, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim, you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Guys, through the handiwork of the devil and his warfare, the culture has assaulted masculinity for decades stripping away all of that which is good and celebrating the emasculation of men. Because of this, men within the culture and even within the church have abandoned their responsibilities. Their responsibilities to be protectors. Their responsibilities to be providers and pursuers. And their responsibilities to be the pastor of their home. And unfortunately, they have left devastating voids within the hearts of their children, within their marriages, and even their employers and communities. Incredible data, devastating data, on what is taking place within the culture as a result of the decline of masculinity within America. Listen to this. 25% of children live without a father in the home. America has the highest rate of single parent households in the world. On average, a child spends 30 minutes of face-to-face -face interaction with their dads each week, each week, compared to 44 hours of screen time and video games. When I was an administrator, I often did social experiments with our students, and I found that those who are most frequently in my office for those wonderful behavioral uh, intervention and meetings, I often check their phone to see how many hours they were on their phone. And on average, the students that I saw most frequently in the office, on average, were on their devices nine hours a day. 
90% of all homeless and runaway children, 63% of teen suicides, and 85% of children and teens with behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. Fatherlessness also has a link to abortion rates. One out of every three pregnancies in a fatherless home end in abortion. Roughly 70% of teenage pregnancies come from women raised in fatherless homes, and these same women have significantly higher abortion rates than women raised by both a father and a mother. Now, additionally, there are industries across the country that have uh, traditionally greater roles of masculinity, and those industries are suffering. Don't believe me. Go ask. Go research. Go look around the country. How is our military and defense uh, operating? How's aviation coming along? How's construction? How are the trades across the country, carpenters and electricians and plumbers? How are our first responders, law enforcement and fire? What about our science and technology, engineering and mathematics? These fields are suffering. Men, you're needed more now than you have ever been needed before. So let us address the responsibilities we have as men, as pastors of our home, as contributors to the church. Go ahead and grab your Bibles, open up again to 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 1 to 13, and follow along with me. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens, alone, and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it has happened, as you know. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain." Verse 6, but now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Verse 9, for what thanks can we render to God for you, for all the joy with which we, we rejoice, for your sake before our God, night and day, praying exceedingly, that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Verse 11, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Let's pray together, you guys. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. Lord, we thank you for the tremendous responsibility we have as men, a responsibility that can only endure, a responsibility that can only uh, exist, and be fulfilled by you. So Lord, we pray that you would speak to us, speak through us, Lord, um, today, in which we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, we're going to go ahead and go through three points from today's passage. Starting with point number one is a man considers. Again, point number one is a man considers. Paul tells us in verse one, when we could no longer endure it, Paul loves his people. Men must consider the needs of others before our wants. Again, let me repeat it. Men must consider the needs of others before our wants. Matthew 20, verse 28 says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. A man with an authentic and honest pastoral heart will care more about the spiritual condition of his family or his people than of his own success, his own reputation, and even his own trials. Oswald Sanders said, true leaders must be willing to suffer 
for the sake of objectives great enough to demand their wholehearted obedience. Paul said he could no longer endure the separation. So, in verse 2, he sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. Paul relied on his brothers in Christ. His expressed vulnerabilities were met by the aid and the capacity of his brothers. Ecclesiastes 4.10-12 through 12 says, For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Guys, we need to stop keeping our needs from brothers who can meet them. Likewise, we need to meet the expressed needs of others when it's within our capacity. If we have the time, if we have the finances, if we have the materials, we need to come alongside our brothers. Again, likewise, we need to make sure we have opportunities and the ability to admit when we have needs. We need to have expressed vulnerabilities and depend on one another to get through this life. We need to be wise We need to be honest, and we need to encourage. Verses 2 through 4 says, To establish you and encourage you concerning your faith, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. For, in fact, we told you before we were with you that we would suffer tribulation, just as it happened, and you know. Guys, I'm not sure if there's a greater way to establish and encourage our families than by strengthening the faith of them. We need, we have a responsibility to find ways to bring truth into everything we do with our families. Maybe it's while running. I enjoy running with my son. The other day we were running and in Southern California, our mountains were filled with snow. It was breathtaking to look up and to see the mountains on this run. We were running together and we looked up and said, wow, that mountain range is beautiful. How spectacular. Son, God made those for us to enjoy. Really, Dad? How do we know that? Because it says so in the Bible. Psalm 121, 1 and 2 says, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. What about when you observe the stars at night? Our family loves to go to national parks. And we took a trip up to Great Basin and we sat through a a presentation at Great Great Basin National Park. And the park ranger after his presentation said, families, why are you guys here? Why did you come up here? And I raised my hand and I said, because the Bible tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows his handiwork. That's right out of Psalm 19, verse 1. We need to make sure we share those things, those truths with our families. Or even when, while acknowledging a hard day, a hard day with your families, a hard day with your colleagues, a hard day with your employees. Maybe it's a hard week. Maybe it's even a hard season. And we can respond when we can say, I get it. This has been a rough couple of days, but I'm in this with you. I know it seems impossible, but I promise you that good will come. But how do you know? How do you know that good will come? Because it says it right here. It says it right in in God's word. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Brothers, we have to remind each other, we have to remind our fellow pastors of the home that trials and persecution will occur for the believer. Afflictions and suffering are a non-negotiable. It's going to happen. Romans 5, 3 to 4 says, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. I know, it's easier said and read than experienced. But 
other than with Christ and the church and our family, we need to maintain a light grip on all things. A light grip. We need to be able to let go of the car, let go of the RV, to let go of the TV, to let go of the long trips, or maybe even some friendships. As persecution occurs, we have to cling to what is good. And what is that? Clinging to what is good? It is Christ. It is the church. It is your family. Romans 12, 1 to 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Guys, our minds are being preoccupied by stuff. We are clinging to our stuff. Stuff like iPads, social media, jet skis, maybe even Little League or dance, maybe even our phones or even fast food or coffee. Guys, we have to turn it off. We have to loosen or even let go of our grip entirely and be present. Present with our families, present with the church, and present with the Lord. We have to consider our relationships with the Lord, your relationships with your family. Guys, we need to consider your relationships with the church. Let me, let me reemphasize this. Relationships must take priority over things, which takes us into point number two. A man is comforted. Paul tells us in verse six through eight, but now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Do you have a teenager? Have you ever told your teenager, you can go out with your friends, but I want you to call me at 9 p.m. just to let me know that you're safe. And they don't. At first, it's probably a little bit annoying, a little bit frustrating. So you wait a couple minutes, giving them a shot, but they don't call you, so then you call them and they don't answer. Then you call again, and again they don't answer. And then you call again, and again they don't answer. Anxiety is likely to be setting in at this point, but then you get the call. Sorry, Dad, I was on the other line with Mom. Good news brings delight to your spirit. Isn't it the same feeling when your kids say, I love you, Dad? or when your wife holds your hand or leans on your shoulder. Better yet, when your kids repent and accept Christ as their Lord and Savior, as we invest in our relationships with Christ, as we invest in our relationship with the church and our family, we will long to be with them. We will celebrate the opportunities we have to be comforted by their affection. I love running with my son. It brings me great joy. I love reading and thinking and dreaming with my daughter. It brings me so much joy. I love being with my wife, Kelsey. I love being with her. She brings me so much joy. I long to be with them because I love them, because we invest intentionally with our relationships with each other. I am so thankful for the time we have together. Verse 9, For what thanks can we render to God for you, for all the joy with which we rejoice, for your sake before our God? Are you a grateful man? Do you ever express gratitude? How do you express gratitude? How do others in your life best receive gratitude? 
When do they feel most appreciated? Guys, our expression of gratitude means nothing if it's not received well. Do we express gratitude with words? Like, thank you for making my lunch. Thank you for making the time to serve me and our family. Some may really appreciate that. Some are really blessed by affirming words. For others, words mean very little. Some may want to see action. They may want to have your time and attention. Some may wish to receive a small gift or a card. Others may simply want to be hugged. This may sound familiar. If you haven't read The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman, I strongly recommend it. It'll change your life. It'll change your relationships. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. Be grateful, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Guys, having gratitude toward others is essential. But also expressing gratitude and dependency for the Lord through prayer is even more important. Verse 10, night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Paul prayed fervently for his people, modeling after Christ. How often do you pray? How often do you pray for your wife, for your children, for your grandchildren? How often do you pray together as a family? Our family prays many times throughout the day together, but we make it a point to pray every night as a family, to close out the day in unity together. It is prayer that brings our hearts, our minds, our strength together as a family. Philippians 4, 6-7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known, be made known to God. Listen, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It is that peace that we desire, especially before bed. At the end of the night, it is that peace uh, that we desire, a peace that surpasses all understanding. But guys, regardless of how many books, how many magazines, how many documentaries we own or have watched, parenting is impossible without prayer. Dr. Dobson shares, there is not enough knowledge in the books, not enough human wisdom anywhere on earth to guarantee the outcome of parenting. There are too many factors beyond our control, too many evil influences that mitigate the, against the Christian message. Guys, expressing gratitude and praying continuously, I get it. These are not attributes of the heart that come easily for men. The working of the Holy Spirit, along with discipline, is required to see and experience a change of heart. Which takes us to our third and final point. A man is committed. Verses 11 to 13 says, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Charles Spurgeon said, I take it that as a minister, he is always praying. As a pastor of your home, always praying. He is not always in the act of prayer, but he lives in the spirit of it. What does that look like? What does that mean practically? That means, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for that bird waking me up in the morning, even if it was my rooster. Thank you, Lord, for toothpaste, for body wash, for deodorant. Thank you, Lord, for my son's sense of humor. Thank you, Lord, for my daughter's smile. Thank you, Lord, for the car starting this morning. 
Lord, take care of my family today while I'm at work. I trust you. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. As we commit our families to the Lord, as we commit our very lives to the Lord, how would you rate your walk? John MacArthur asks a few great questions here. Is knowledge of God's word increasing? Is confidence in God's Is confidence in God greater than before? Do you trust in his sovereignty more? Is your obedience to God more consistent? Are you finding joy in trials? Now, if you're anything like me, you may think, well, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm also not where I once was. Again, we love going to national parks. We love hiking in together as a family. And there have been times when we have had to scale mountains together. And at the bottom of the mountain, we look up at the trail and we think, oh my goodness, that is a long hike. We got to start somewhere. So we start going up the, the trail. And about halfway through the day, we look up and see how much further we have to go and think that is a really far way away. But then we turn around and we look down the hill and think, I am sure glad we made it this far already. It's a great analogy. We're not where we want to be but we're also glad that we aren't where we once were. We must commit to pursuing the Lord and leading our families, guys, to do the same. As the pastor of your home, Deuteronomy 6, 5 to 7, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. For the sake of Christ, his family, and the church, a man considers. A man is comforted. A man is committed. A man endures. I wanted to share a quote with you from a friend of ours at the church. We recently started a ministry for young men and their dads. And this, this man was, uh, was writing in response to this ministry. He says, the last few years have been a tough time for our family. I developed internal bleeding in my intestinal tract that doctors could not diagnose properly due to the location, type of bleed, and intermittentness. At the same time, my entire friend network seemed to dissipate overnight. I went from having a group of five men that I thought would die for me to having no one around. I was in the lowest valley of my life, constant pain at a level of seven to nine, bleeding internally and feeling totally abandoned and alone. But the Lord was at work. He was dealing with my pride, my reliance on my size, and my strength. What I thought were my abilities, my attitude that I was the one everyone could rely on. He was turning my focus to him, making me weak so I could only rely on him, filling my abandoned heart with his love. He was breaking down my pillars and solidifying a corrected foundation of reliance on him and him alone. He says, thank you again for the church's hospitality, its love for our family, and our growing friendships. Pastor Jack has shared that God designed us for a purpose, not for our pleasure. So guys, when our marriage isn't fun, when parenting seems impossibly complex, when we suffer through pain and heartache, When work is dismantling our happiness, when those we love let us down, when you're down by one, bottom of the ninth, a man holds fast, a man stands firm, through Christ, a man faithfully perseveres. Let's go ahead and pray. God, again, we thank you for your truth. Father, we pray that we would be pastors of the home, Lord, that we would be influencers for change that we would see to it that if it's by our will, Lord, that the culture changes. If it's by your will, the world changes, Lord. God, you designed us exactly right. 
You designed us to be who we are, to be the leaders of the home, to be leaders of the church, to be leaders within the community. I pray, God, that these men would stand firm, Lord, and faithfully persevere. God, we give you all the praise and the glory that's yours and yours alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you guys.